Mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord the Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as Pastor mentioned, today is my last sermon as associate pastor. God willing, it won't be my last sermon here at Bethany. I'm scheduled to preach once a month, so you can't get rid of me that easily. <laughs> uh, today we're going to examine the question, uh, what is the secret to lasting joy? I think this will be my shortest sermon ever, right? What is the secret to lasting joy? Retirement. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I know, retirement isn't perfect, right? Uh, they say the trouble with retirement is that uh, you never get a day off, so I guess I'll never get a day off. And at least now I can do anything I want, right? as long as Linda says it's okay. so and I'm just kidding. No, um, retirement is not the key or the secret to uh, living uh, a life of lasting joy. That is not the answer, but the teacher in our text today uh, does provide the answer. Uh, so far in Ecclesiastes, the, the teacher has looked at this fallen world and um, what he's found is, is really just tragedy and heartache. Uh, through his own observations and experiments and insights, um, he tried to find the meaning in life, and he failed. In fact, if anything, I think he found out that the world is, is far worse than he even imagined. And so we learn that humans can't figure out life's problems, let alone solve life's problems. But one certainty is this, the teacher has mentioned this many times in this book so far, um, that in all times and in all places, um, people have been interested in accumulating wealth. I'd like us to open our Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Um, if you're using a pew Bible, you may turn to page 555, 555. Um, I'd like to do most of the reading today because it's a little lengthy, but we're going to read the most important section as we get there. Um, I'll begin by reading verses 8 and 9 of Ecclesiastes 5. Hear the word of the Lord. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter, for the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. So um, what we learn here is about our government leaders. It says, because government leaders have such a hunger for riches, don't be surprised when the poor people are taken advantage of and the leaders are crooked. He said that's what's going to happen. In verse 8, he says, the high official is watched by a higher one. And when I first read that, I thought they're watching them to make a mistake. But then um, through study and doing some reading, this watched by really refers to they look out for one another. So in other words, all the high officials are looking out for one another to see that everybody's doing okay. You know, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine, you scratch mine. So these high officials, they have no concern for the poor. Their only concern is really lining their own pockets. Then in verse 9, we learn that the best case scenario is to live in a land where the ruler uses the land as it's intended. In other words, to plant crops, uses it for food, because that way, not only will the leaders have food, but also the poor. So that's how the teacher starts out in this section of Ecclesiastes 5. I'd now like to read for you the next section, verses 10 through 12. Please follow if you're able. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich 
will not let him sleep. So the teacher warns people here who seek to be rich and who pursue money um, as life's goal. He says to them, you're never going to be satisfied. There's always going to be a want for more. There's always going to be more money to be had. Verse 11, it says, when goods increase, they increase who eat them. And, and what that's referring to is other people consuming the goods that one individual acquires. In other words, once a man or an individual gets rich, um, often they need more people to help them. Maybe they need a maid to, to help take care of their house, or a gardener to take care of the grounds, or a nanny to take care of the children. Maybe they need a chauffeur to drive them around, or an accountant to check their money, and a broker to invest their money, or a bodyguard to make sure that they're safe. So what gain does the owner have of all those goods? Well, no gain whatsoever. He gains nothing. He just watches other people consume his money. Verse 12 tells us that the rich can't sleep. And the reason they can't sleep is that they're worried about their riches. You know, will their investments be safe? Uh, will there be a recession? Uh, will they lose everything overnight? And so they turn and, and toss in their beds. But the poor, who have little to be taken anyway, um, are content with what they have. They enjoy their daily bread. The next section in our text is verses 13 through 17. The, as we get into that, um, follow me in verse 13. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. And those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, and he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, and much vexation and sickness and anger. So the teacher says it's evil when people don't enjoy their life, right? He tells about this rich man who lost all that he had overnight, and now he has nothing left to pass down to his child. He said that this man is going to go the way he came. He's going to go naked and empty-handed. Kind of reminds me of the words of Job when Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. So just one bad venture, and it's all gone. A lifetime wasted, nothing at all gained. Verse 17 says that this man, he eats in darkness. So that kind of entails a lot. His friends are gone because his money's gone. Right? His house is foreclosed, his electricity is turned off, and he sits in that kind of darkness. But darkness can also refer to other things in Scripture too, like depression. Right? He, and it says he sits in darkness, he eats in darkness, in much vexation, sickness, and anger. So darkness implies here as a depression. He's depressed. He lost everything he worked for. He has nothing to give to his child. And darkness is also a reference many times to death itself. So there's no joy in this guy's life, and he might as well be dead. Well, that takes us lastly to the end of this text, and that's where we get the good news. And I'd like us to read that together. So let's read from Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. 18 through 20. We read, Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun 
the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. So the teacher here offers this conclusion. It's not just a conclusion for this section, but it's really a conclusion for the whole book. Um, one person, uh, once a person in life is, is overwhelmed, I'd say, with life's difficulties and by his total depravity, he's crushed and he's completely helpless and hopeless. The only th that's, it's only then that that person can be turned by God's Holy Spirit uh, to the last alternative, which is Jesus, right? And the Scripture says about Jesus that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jesus is, is rich in that he is God. He owns everything. All things belong to him. Yet, because of his great love for you, he gave that up. He humbled himself. He took on our flesh. He left heaven, came down here to earth, and he came down here in humility. A poor, not just, uh, you know, money-wise poor. He was born into a, a poor a family in society, but this poorness refers uh, not only to that, but most importantly to the fact that he, he emptied himself. He, hum he went through a state of humiliation where he didn't always and fully use his power, and he ended up on the cross for you. And through his death on the cross, you have been made rich. He has exchanged... Uh, our sin as we hand it to him and has in exchange given us all his blessings, all his riches, forgiveness, life, salvation, and all the material blessings we need in this life. As I told the kids, he is our priceless treasure. There's nothing more valuable than to possess Jesus through faith in him. And it's the Holy Spirit then that enables us um, once having brought us to faith, to turn everything over to Jesus, trusting in Jesus' grace and mercy. And so we trust that Jesus is in charge and that he'll take care of in his own time and way absolutely everything in our lives. Jesus will take care of life's problems, life's disappointments, life's sadness, um, the apparent meaning, meaninglessness that we see in this life. He'll take care of our sin, our depravity, and most of all, life's outcome, right? Because now, through his resurrection, when we die, we go through that doorway of death to a, a life forever with him in heaven. Jesus knows. Jesus cares. Jesus does it all. Now, if Jesus does it all, what's left for you to do? The answer, nothing, right? Especially when it comes to salvation and it comes to our joy, the joy that we feel because we learn God himself gives us those things. God describes in these verses how to respond to his gifts in a God-pleasing way. Verse 18 teaches us that we are to open our empty hands and to receive God's gifts with joy and with thanksgiving. Uh, enjoy life's simple blessings, including the tasks that God gives you in all the different vocations that you find yourself in. Life itself is a gift from God, even life in this broken world. And we know that life on earth is short. It's temporary. But the good news is as Christians, we know through God's word that when your life, your earthly life is over, 
you'll joyfully return to God, to the place that Jesus is preparing for you. And so I encourage you, let that joy, the joy of knowing that you will spend eternity with Jesus, let that permeate your life right here and right now. Right? That joy can never be taken away from you no matter what happens in this life. Remember the words from Romans 8.18, our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Verse 19, that verse tells us that even the ability to enjoy life and God's blessings is a gift from God. You know, when I started working here back in 2001, um, I knew that my time at Bethany was temporary, right? I knew that one day um, I would have to leave under one circumstance or another, right? But God has enabled me these 23 years to be able to enjoy my time here. And he used my time here to provide for me and my family and and, and I pray for you, too. He provided for me and my family um, through my work here, a house and food and clothes, also uh, money to pay our bills, and he provided special friends for me here, and spiritual growth through pastors, through principals, through teachers, through deacons here, and, and through all, each and every one of you as members of this congregation. And God has given me the ability to enjoy the gift of working in this congregation with you. And I'm so thankful for that blessing. He's enabled me to be satisfied with his gifts no matter how little or how great um, those gifts were, no matter how much or little he, he saw fit to give to me. Verse 20 tells us that God keeps us so busy with his blessings that we'll have no time to worry, right? Just chew on that for a little bit, right? Reminds me of Pastor Mark Rhine, something he said to me. He's a pastor at Royal Redeemer. And uh, we had a circuit meeting this year, and I came up to Mark and I shook his hand and I said, hey, Mark, how you doing? And he said, Rick, I'm just tripping over blessings, man, just tripping over blessings. <laughs> and I haven't forgotten that, you know. God gives us so many blessings, it's even hard to walk, right, sometimes. And I know that during my 23 years here, I've been tripping over blessings too. It's a good way to say it. The Lord has, has filled my heart with joy um, over you all. And I thank him for bringing me here and for using me as he saw fit uh, to bless you and, and to bless uh, the children here. And then I thank you. I thank you for uh, being a blessing to me and to my family and for keeping a promise that you made when I was ordained and installed here. You promised to support me in my ministry and to pray for me. And I just want to say uh, thank you so much for that support for your prayers, well done, good and faithful servants. So God says uh, in these verses 18 through 20, he says, rejoice. He says, enjoy yourself, enjoy the gifts I give you. From the big eternal gifts like forgiveness and life and salvation down to the smallest gifts of your daily bread. Have fun in the tasks that I assign to you. You'll get so busy doing useful, good things to my glory that you won't even have time to worry. And then I want to say from my words to you, enjoy your church, Bethany. Enjoy this congregation. Enjoy the family of faith that God has led here. Enjoy the facilities that he's blessed us with and the people who keep up those facilities. Enjoy our school the principal, our teachers, the children, their families, and, and all those that have any part of, of keeping that school a, a safe and clean place. Enjoy our church and, and the, the leaders that God has placed here. 
Enjoy the workers that God gives us. Enjoy our children. Not every congregation has children. Enjoy the children God has provided. Enjoy the fellowship opportunities that we have. The uh, opportunity to get to know your brothers and sisters in Christ better. Enjoy the learning that takes place here as we get to know God better and his plan for our lives and his love for us and his son, our Savior Jesus. And enjoy the opportunities to serve the Lord here in this place. And then pray this prayer, which we sing often in church. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Amen.